Good evening and welcome to tonight's Lockdown Learning. My name is Bren Carlo and I am the Director of Public Affairs at the Zionist Federation of Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I speak, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Knowing that this conversation is being watched in every Australian state, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which people are watching this. Tonight, I am delighted to host a special panel of Australians connected in one way or another to the Battle of Beersheba. I'll introduce you to Elsie, Ray and Danny shortly. Before doing so, I want to remind you that this Thursday evening will mark the beginning of the 25th anniversary of the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, according to the Jewish calendar. That evening, the ZFA will host the Rabin Oration, a one hour commemoration of Rabin's life and legacy. Our orator is Omar Barlev, and we will also be joined by Rabin's daughter, Dahlia Rabin. To find out details and to register, please visit zfa.com.au forward slash Rabin. And next Sunday's lockdown learning will continue the theme as we launch the book, Remembering Rabin, a collection of reflections from 24 Australians or Israelis with a special connection to Australia. The book looks not only at the life and legacy of Rabin, but also how the contributors have incorporated the lessons of Rabin's murder into their personal and professional lives and life choices. Collectively, it shows us how Rabin, murdered on the other side of the world a quarter of a century ago, still influences the Australian Jewish community. Next week's guests include two contributors to the book, Simone Tsamok Singer and Sam Lipsky. But let's turn to tonight's guests. Pastor Ray Minikon is a descendant of the Kavi Kavi Nation and the Gurungur Nation of Southeast Queensland. Ray is also a descendant of the South Sea Islander people with deep and abiding connections to the people of Ambrim Island. Ray is the director of Bungie Consultancies, the honorary Indigenous minister at St. John's Anglican Church in Glebe, Sydney, the uh, community chaplain and board member of Babana Aboriginal Men's Group, and a board member of Red Dust Role Models which takes elite athletes and professional role models to remote Aboriginal communities to inspire young Aboriginal children to make healthy life choices and stay in school. Elsie Amamu is a Kawakabi Aboriginal woman from Cherbourg in Queensland, who is co-owner of the Sydney-based Aboriginal media business Inception Strategies and the mother of two. Elsie is presently studying a Cert four in primary healthcare and most recently worked at the Australian Maritime Museum as an Aboriginal cultural interpreter and curriculum officer. Danny Hakim is the founder of Budo for Peace, a nonprofit educational organization that promotes tolerance and coexistence in youth from different social sectors in Israel through sport. In 2018, Budo for Peace was awarded the Regional NGO of the Year by the Prince of Monaco Peace and Sport Organization. Danny is also a director of the Azraeli Foundation Israel, a board member of the Alliance for Middle East Peace, Kids Kicking Cancer Israel, Maccabi World Union, Sick Theatre in Jerusalem, and the Israel Life Saving Federation, and he's a two-time world karate champion. Danny, I'll start with you. Now, um, pretty much everyone in Australia knows about Gallipoli. They know that Anzacs fought at Gallipoli and they know that Gallipoli was a failure, a glorious defeat, if you like. But Beersheba was actually a great military victory, but I would argue that it's not as well known in Australia and certainly not as well known as it should be. Now, I'm sure that most of the people watching us tonight uh, do know a little bit about Anzacs and Beersheba, but can you tell us the big picture, why were the Anzacs in Beersheba in October 31, 1917? Okay, well, first of all, the, the battle really was a, a miracle. Um, when you consider that there was General Allenby and 60,000 people trying to attack Beersheba and they couldn't do it, and this is from the Gaza side, the Western side, and the light horsemen, 800 of them were decided to go around three days in the desert and charge. It was a, only a five kilometer charge, but they, the defense, the Turkish defense, you know, that entrenched infantry, that machine guns, they also had um, uh, planes, German planes bombing them. So with all this happening and they had very little light and no water, the Australians were able to win 
And I think the, the, the idea that it was a victory, I think one of the first victories for the Australian troops, um, it should be something that should be celebrated. And I would like to see um, in the Anzac pilgrimage tours to Israel, not just to Gallipoli. And there are many other places uh, in Israel that these Anzacs had fought. But this particular uh, fight um, really opened the gates into the Holy Land. And I think that's why it's a significant thing. When I grew up in Australia, we heard about Gallipoli only. Only when I came to Israel, I realized, wow, this is a story to be told. So it was actually um, also the first battle that was ever won on horseback as well by the Australians and the British um, and also the um, Zealand. New Zealander soldiers as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so. um, Ray, you, um, I can see that, that you're in the part there of, of, of the Anzac, the Anzac soldiers. But there were obviously um, Indigenous Australians among those Anzacs, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, notwithstanding that not many or not enough Australians know about um, the Anzac role on Besheva, I'm sure it's also not very widely known about the Indigenous Australians that enlisted with the Anzacs. Are you able to tell us how many um, were there and, and, and particularly why they did it, particularly since, you know, they weren't even considered um, citizens in, in, in their own country? Oh, sorry, Ray, you're, you're on mute. There we go. G'day. There, is that better? Yeah. Okay. What a wonderful question. And uh, once again, a history that's been sort of, uh, I was gonna say whitewashed, but uh, it's been blackwashed <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably um, where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it, it's so important to, 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 you know, know our history. And it's nearly, what is it, 103 years now three. since Beersheba, yeah. This month too. No, hang on, last month. So this is really this an, an important, it is too, sorry, it is. It really is an important battle. And it was the fourth and the twelfth light horse that uh, was the main ones who did that particular charge. Eight hundred horsemen. I don't think I'd like to be in those uh, trenches watching those horses come at us, but that's what happened. <clears throat> the light horse. Our, my grandfather, also Elsie's grandfather, was in the eleventh light horse. The eleventh light horse was called the Black Watch because it had a whole number of Indigenous soldiers in it mainly from Queensland, but also from um, uh, New Northern South Wales and New South Wales as yeah. well. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> they were in the area and they, uh, they were used as clean up afterwards uh, when they went into that particular area there, uh, the Black Wash. There was over a hundred Aboriginal soldiers in the light horse and uh, that's a significant number when you consider the uh, treatment of Aboriginal people who weren't even recognised in the Constitution. We were still under the doctrine of notion of terra nullius. In fact, at that particular time, there was a politician in Canberra. His name was uh, King O'Malley. He said that the Aborigine, there, <clears throat> there is no evidence that the Aborigine is a human being at all. <laughs> wow. wow. So I didn't, know that. I didn't know that. I knew <laughs> I knew a lot of good things about King O'Malley. I didn't I didn't know he said that. So when you've got that kind of uh, per perceptions about us, it does make it a. You, you can understand why we were whitewashed out of history. Yeah. <laughs> and what about what about when the um, these Aboriginal troops came home from the war? Were they were they recognised or were they fettered or were they ignored? No, they it, they were ignored. It it, it depends depends it too upon the friendships that they had. There were one or two of them who got <clears throat> some kind of recognition, but we came back under the act again, under the various, uh, we came under state acts at that time, the very, uh, uh, not, not the federal government, but the state governments. And they were quite brutal uh, regimes that governed us. You know, they governed everything about us in terms of uh, our children could be taken, we could be taken. Um, our, our money, all kinds of things. And we put on these particular reserves and missions 
where we weren't even allowed. We had to have permissions to get off of those things there. Mm. And, and who you married as well. Who and you who married. You married and, and where also, you worked. Um, and also when the money was sent back to the community, um, mm. a portion of the income was taken by the missionaries. And then mm. only a, probably 10% was given to the families. Mm. So in terms of my grandfather, <clears throat> I'm, I'm still trying to fathom why he, I had two grandfathers there, James Lingwadock and John Geary. They both joined up together. They both got married on the same day together up there in Brisbane. And uh, they went off to war together. Now, uh, he married Granny, Granny Daisy, but Granny Daisy wasn't my grandmother. That's, you know, in the uniform, he had a, he had another lady, my grandmother, uh, and uh, Elsie and I make a joke that we could have some cousins over there. <laughs> I'll look them up. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> now, Elsie, your great great grandfather was an Anzac. Uh, do you know how much do you know about him? Not very much. Um... Like even just growing up, I didn't really know very much about him. But um, I think it was also because when my mum was younger, she never really knew of him either, because she she actually he actually passed away <clears throat> before she was born. So um, we only heard stories um, through other family members um, who were alive at the time, or it was like a generational thing where they passed the stories down. So so yeah, no, it's. Um, my story is actually an interesting one. My grandfather was married to um, um, an Aboriginal woman on the reserve before he left, and then he got injured um, in the in the battle, and then he had an infection, and then it took, I think, like a month later for him to eventually arrive back to Australia, and then within that time. They never received the telegram. They only they assumed that he had died, and so a telegram was sent back to the mission to say that he'd died. And so then the missionary said, "Oh, look, you can move on with somebody else if you want to do that." And so that's basically what had happened. And then he returns oh. back after war, and then yeah, finds that he, she's in a new relationship with somebody else, and then right. he yeah. So what so, happened? What, what was the um oh, I think what had happened was just all hell broke loose between all three parties. So, yeah, so he he saw Red. Um, I think she was just um, shocked from the sheer embarrassment of the fact that he had returned. And mm, she was like, no, 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 yeah, but you had yeah. died. Everybody said that you yeah, died. She warned him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, yeah, so I think it was also just and in those times as well in the dire straits where you weren't considered to be an independent woman unless you were married. Um, in those in those in the in those day and ages so and I think that's what her biggest concern was she didn't she wanted the independence but she also needed to find somebody else who was willing to take her um, on as well and so then that's when my great-grandmother um, and my grandfather my great-grandfather ended up getting together then and then that's how um, the rest of the children were um, were born yeah right. Yeah. So if it wasn't for that particular moment to happen, I probably wouldn't be here today. Yeah. yeah. Danny, you're in cycling gear as we speak. Thanks for again for, for playing the part. <laughs> Your I idea. Mean, um, but, but, and, and you started Ride I'm Like ready. An Anzac. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Even more so. Even more so. Look, what is Ride Like an Anzac? Can you tell us, um, you know, when it started, how many people go each year, that sort of thing? Okay, well, the idea started when, um, when the centenary was coming around. And I thought, you know, I, I usually go to the commemorations uh, in Jerusalem and in Beersheba. And I thought, you know, it's such an amazing story. And, um, you know, it changed the course of history in the Middle East. And it was such a victory. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to go on my bike and see what it's like. And then I realized that the JNF have this whole trail, a hundred kilometer trail that's been um, manicured with posters of where the troops stopped and where they uh, gave water to the horses and, 
And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to actually live that history instead of just, you know, reading poems and prayers? And that's who I thought, you know, why don't we try and ride like the Anzacs? And uh, it was an idea I thought with my mates and uh, we ended up getting 300 people. And then also when I heard about the indigenous Anzacs, I did not know about that. It wasn't written anywhere. And I thought, this is really worth making a film uh, about the indigenous and how they came to respect their elders and their ancestors. And also, you know, all these young and uh, Israelis. And actually we had Canadians that came as well and Israelis and how writing like an Anzac would be much more meaningful. And that's how it came about. And also, you know, when we talk about the, the Anzac heritage and the values, you know, like mateship and perseverance and courage and tolerance, it all made sense, you know, to actually go and feel what it was like. And it was a... Uh... So how many people rode with you? Sorry? How many people rode with you? Altogether, we had 300. Wow. It was a, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a quite, um, we had a one day and we had a two day and, uh, and C Cadell Evans heard about it and he rang me up from Switzerland and he said, can you join? And I said, sure. Uh, but it was quite funny. You know, I don't know if you know what it's like. Um, to ride in a low gear. Sorry? You have to tell him to ride in a low gear, you know, so everyone yeah. can keep up with him. <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was quite funny because um, Cadell looked on the map, where is the Anzac Trail? And it's right along the border of Gaza. And he asked me, is it safe? I said, sure it is, don't worry, we'll ride like an Anzac, right? And on the first day we're riding and we hear a big boom and we look behind us and there's smoke and we didn't oh know God. what it was. And he said, is it all right? I said, don't worry, we'll ride like Anzacs. And, uh, and the Israel Defense Forces found a tunnel that came from Hamas and blew it up. And that's what it was. And because of that, the last day, uh, the IDF had to move our uh, uh, final, uh, the gates, because they put in um, anti-missile system to the place that we had planned, six months of planning, right? <laughs> so uh, anyhow, we were able to finish it. And uh, it was, it was a, and the point is, I didn't want to do it just a one-off every 100 years. I want to do it every year. And to, to really uh, bring tourism and sports tourism and to honor uh, what happened. And we did it uh, the year after, always with the ambassador. And last year, we planned to do it. The night before, a missile came from Gaza. And the ambassador said, sorry, you know, he'd like to ride, but it's not so that it's Canberra wouldn't give him the permission. Mm. And we had 20 Australian soldiers that were going to ride as well. All right. In the morning, yeah, you know, in the Sinai. And uh, the morning of, they had to cancel. But we still had you know, 50 people. And we had uh, Barbie after and tug of war. And anyhow, it's a, really a family event now. And uh, we're actually going to do it again this year, this Friday but it's uh, only up to 20 people because right. of the coronavirus. Of course, of course. I do want to- but We're um, gonna ride like Anzacs. I do want to uh, talk to you in a little bit about that trail, but Ray, you obviously participated in the reenactment on the, on the centennial reenactment. <coughs> um, why? I mean, uh, do you, you know, did you grow up with horses or what's, what's the- No. Well, look, uh, <laughs> before I do that, I just want to acknowledge a few people here who, who made this possible. If it wasn't for them, we would never have got there. Uh, Jennifer Simmons and uh, <clears throat> uh, Roland Grittiger and uh, uh, David Langley, you know, the Rona Tramby Trust really, really made this happen for us. Absolutely. And they came along and they uh, wanted to do this story. We didn't even know how many Aboriginal people were in the light horse. And until Roland and them got hold of this story and put the message out there and got it uh, our people to respond to it. We took, I think, uh, 13 Aboriginal descendants of over there. 
which was quite a astonishing thing to raise that kind of cash flow within six months, let the governments know that Aboriginal people, that the descendants of <clears throat> were going to be there. So these characters, you know, uh, rolling on them were just absolutely amazing in the things that they had done in such a short amount of time. So I'm so honoured and so privileged and so thankful and humbled by the Jewish community here in Sydney who made this possible. And I did get a, a, a message here from Peter to Peter Allen, who said that, that there was about 50 Australian Jews in the light horse that we can't forget either. And uh, um, so, you know, th there is a huge, big, powerful story here. My reasons for going there is I just wanted to follow in the hoof prints of my grandfather. I wanted to know where he went, why he went and try to, I didn't know my grandfather and I just wanted to uh, uh, know whether I could feel his spirit over there. And there was one moment in that trip over there where I just felt that he was there with me. And that was a time that we were uh, in, in parade marching through the streets of Beersheba and the whole community just came out and was it saying, was an eruption it was an eruption and they were just saying thank you thank you and i just said to my grandfather i said grandfather they're saying thank you to you and it was just such a wonderful moment for me to honor him in that particular way so that the community out there could say thank you not just to him but to all the aboriginal people who had been a part of that particular those particular regiments in the 11th light horse the other thing too, just just uh, another little off, off thing that I read, I don't know if it's true, but the historians can tell us if it's true. And that is that when the light horse did uh, break through at Beersheba, the local mayor there surrendered to the Australian light horse, not to the British. And then a couple of days later, Lawrence of Arabia uh, turns up and he takes the surrender on behalf of the crown. <laughs> so that's a, that's a part of that fascinating story. I would love to see if it was, you know, could be uh, uh, verified or not, but that's what I had read somewhere that uh, the uh, people of the light horse actually surrendered. I mean, the uh, Ottoman Empire the Ottoman Empire surrendered to the Australian light horse at that particular time. The other thing too about it too is uh, while we were over there, especially on horseback, to see the kind of terrain that they fought in was just so unbelievable. And for us to actually experience a bit of that terrain was quite, a, quite astonishing. It was really, really, really difficult for us to comprehend how you could not just ride in that particular, but that particular environment, but also to, to actually have a war in it was even much more striking and much more challenging. But there was one funny point in our journey through the desert there on horseback was we was trying to experience this wonderful experience of following in our grandfather's footprints, hoofprints, I should say, we pulled up and we camped one night just to try to get an experience of living out in the desert under the stars. And where we camped, we set up our hoochies and everything of that nature. We were really uh, you know, feeling the heat and all, all of those kind of things. And guess what turned up at our little campsite? Was two ice cream vans. <laughs> Remember that, Elsie? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, oh Lord, these fellas have taken away my experience. <laughs> and they took credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny. Yeah, it blew all my experiences away. And I, <laughs> I well, didn't get an ice cream. I couldn't get an ice cream. I couldn't. I just... right, they, right, they could have been uh, descendants of the Bedouins who were there. <laughs> They could have been Probably, too, but yeah. it was just, it was just yeah. so funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I want to say something uh, in in the film. Uh, you say something, Ray, which is very powerful. You say we we have an amnesia about how we got to where we are. Stories that weave us together, and you just want to set the record straight. And you know that I think that is very powerful um, for many people. Mm. Um, and I can tell you, you know, my, my parents are from Egypt. They are Jews from Arab lands. And that's a story that also hasn't been told. And uh, this is something that, uh, you know, I'm trying to rectify as well by, uh, by telling that story. And even in Israel, very few people know that more than 50% of the population from, uh, in Israel are Jews from Arab lands. So mm. when you talk about getting the record straight or um, the truth will set you free, I think it's very powerful mm. for everyone. Hi, uh, you're back. G'day, um, power outage. Uh, somehow, miraculously, the three of you stayed on the call and it seems to still be live on internet. I've joined with my, my iPad and I'm gonna... Um, wow, sorry. brother. Can you read it? I was thinking, hey, this fellow is getting his tan on here. <laughs> no no so i'm um i'm gonna try and drag up my notes um uh thank you again and uh and, and the uh, the wonders of living out uh, in the bush there's um it happens every now and then elsie what i wanted to ask you was um again about the um uh the ride because it was a three-day ride right um yeah I've, yeah i've been on a horse for a couple of hours at a time I haven't been on a horse for three days. Yeah. Um, but in the documentary, and I, I will talk a little bit about the film a little bit. I don't know if you talked about the film in the 10 minutes that I, that I wasn't here, but, but um, it, it showed that you were riding a horse sort of back home before, before, the, before the ride to Beersheba, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, Uncle Ray, myself, and a couple of the other participants who had also had family members that were also um, in the Beersheba in the Beersheba war. They also participated as well. And then there were also just members from the Aboriginal community that were also doing a lot of um, Anzac rides in the Northern Territory. We also had um, a gentleman by the name of um, Ricky Lovett as well, who's who's the fourth generation um, uh, representative of um, the Australian Defence Force. So um, he had just in the um, First and Second World War alone, that was, it, I think there was two brothers um, that were um, fighting in the, in the Australian um, First World War and the Second World War as well. So yeah, so that was um, um, an amazing milestone to have that opportunity of sharing that, um, that role with him and yeah, and, and just having that experience more so than anything else, just having the opportunity of riding on horseback was one thing, but just having that military experience um, firsthand whilst mm -hmm. we were on the trip, that was another, that was another thing. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there was no, you know, hotel with a warm bath. Or... <laughs> no, we, like, like Uncle Ray said, uh, we were basically um, doing it tough. We were out with the flies, out with the dust. We were... <laughs> And the ice creams. <laughs> and the ice cream and the ice cream fans. Yeah. So there was, I think there was only one stage where we got, where we had a little bit of luxury, where we got to have a shower on, on one of the bases. And that was when we went to one of the better wind camps. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. So that was really nice having that opportunity as well. Just, just to, just to have a shower more so than anything else after three days. I think that was the biggest luxury more so than anything else. So yeah, but no, overall it was an amazing experience, and and as I was like, whilst I was writing, I was there thinking to myself, this should be something that should be shared with other family members of mine as well, not just with me and my mum, and just the community mob that I had there as well. And um, because I was so far away from home, I was also feeling homesick. But having Uncle Ray and all the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members there just made it just that little bit more. Um, easier to just overcome that that homesickness 
Um, but more so to the point, I was probably missing my children and my husband more so. Yeah, mostly my children probably. Yeah. Yeah. My husband though. <laughs> <laughs> You're a brave lady. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it was fun. It was very fun. But um, it was also very hard as well because we it was probably one of the hardest trips that I'd done because I'd also lost my grandmother. So my two of my godfathers who I lived with whilst I was living in South Australia, it was their mum who had passed away as well. And, um, and also um, my husband's younger brother as well. So I'd also lost him on, whilst I was on the trip. So wow. that, yeah. So um, that was huge as well because I could have, had the opportunity of flying back when I did, but when I called the family, I, they basically said, no, you've already done all the hard work. You've put in the hard yards for all the horse riding lessons. You've you've gone over there. You've also paid for the trip and everything. And people have also invested time and energy into you being there as well. So just do what you want to do. Just be there because that's what you basically told us. And you told it, all the other family members as well that you're doing this. So when you ride in the charge, do it for them as well. So, yeah. So yeah. that one, that in itself was a huge milestone. So once they had finished, it was, yeah. After the ride, after the Beersheba ride was finished, we got to water our horses and take the saddles off them. And then, yeah. And then I, it was then that I was able to just have that opportunity to just mourn for family members who have passed. Yeah. Hmm. I think that was the hardest, yeah, just being so far away from family when all of this was happening. Yeah, and feeling helpless. Yeah, 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 literally. Hmm. Um, Dan, earlier you mentioned the fact that you discovered that this trail was a JNF trail. Um, you know, and does that mean, um, I mean, I mean, what does that mean? Is it my, because I've, I've done some walking trails in Israel and they have, you know, the, the rocks or the trees have got the little, the ribbons or the, uh, or the paint there. Is that what it is? Is it something like, you know, if, if an audience member wants to go over to Israel and, and walk this trail or ride it with you, can they take their kids or like how, how dusty and off the road is it? Okay, well, um, you know, it's quite a long trail and there are small trails. With, sorry? How long is the trail? The whole thing's about 100 kilometres. Right. But okay. the, the, the main one on the kibbutz, yeah, definitely there are smaller loops. Uh, last year, we had uh, two groups. One was for the, the riders and one was for family. And the family did a lovely loop and there are picnic areas. But it's, it's not like the other JNF trails. The JNF Australia actually have posters that are there all year round and they explain about the Anzac Trail and the Anzac. So it really is a riding through history. It's not just a trail and you think um, this is where it was. Yeah. There are posters and banners and there's a huge memorial, um, which every year we do a uh, memorial service there. Is that the one with and the big arch that's right near? The big um, arch, Gar yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. So, um, you know, anybody can do it. There's a bike shop right there in the beginning of the trail. So you can rent bikes. Andy. Yeah. And uh, there's an Australian that back. works there. Yeah. Sorry. Bring them back. Do they, do they take a ute to Beersheba to, <laughs> to, to pick up the bikes? <laughs> so, no, I, I just felt it's a shame. You know, Jane have put so much money uh, into making a trail, but nobody's really uh, promoting it. So this is a way of actually getting more uh, miles for your buck. And, and I think it should be promoted, not just uh, for Jewish uh, people, it's Australians in uh, sports tourism or Anzac uh, pilgrimage tours should spend half a day going on this trail and feeling it. Yeah. And uh, it's not that hard. And there are picnic areas as well. So... Hmm. And I must say, I, I, yeah. I did feel safe over there too. You did? Yeah, I felt safe. Yeah. yeah. Ray and Elsie, I want to, and, and also Danny, um, I want to speak a bit about identity. Um, yeah. Now, Ray and Elsie, you're um, both from your bios that I've read out and also from the way you're speaking, 
um, obviously the uh, you know you, you work with both both locally and, and nationally you work with um, uh, indigenous Australians um, you know how um, is it I guess what I'm asking is you know you know to them how important is it to, to, to the indigenous community in Australia when they hear that there were um, Aborigines in you know in the Anzacs that, that went over there and fought are they receptive to it or do they sort of not really care Oh, no, they're very, very, very receptive and they want to know more. Uh, and I think uh, some of them are pretty angry that they didn't get this, this, this kind of uh, story or this kind of information before. And some of them who do know their story are a little bit angry that the government did not give that proper recognition to our Aboriginal Anzacs uh, right throughout the country because they did come back and came under those particular regimes and they weren't given any of those uh, soldier benefits. They weren't given any of those kind of things. And so they came back under a certain act, uh, the Aboriginal Protection Act. Mm. And uh, that was it. <laughs> Many of them threw their, uh, their medals away because, uh, and you know, they were forced to, to march at the end of the line and all kinds of silly things like that. They weren't allowed in the RSLs or the pubs and, um, so there was no honour or recognition of who they were and what they had achieved for their country. And many of them, some of them even came back with medals. You know, they, they were such heroes on the, on the battlefield, but back here, they were just nobody. Terra have, <laughs> have more modern governments tried to make any amends? Or is it still largely ignored? Oh, look, it, it's, it, I don't think it's the government who does that. I think it's the community. I mean, I started the march in, in Redfern to honour our diggers there back in 2007. And we mm. did get a bit of resistance from the government at the, at the beginning points. But now there's this incredible push and move now to make sure that uh, we're recognised. And uh, given that proper recognition, uh, there's been a lot of more research done in the last uh, you know, 14 or 15 years than they've done in the last 200 years about the Aboriginal people who fought in, in overseas uh, battles for this country here and not giving the recognition due to their uh, services. Elsie, um, both you and Ray are descendants of the, the Kabi Nation um, from Southeast Queensland. And you, you mentioned earlier that, um, that a large number of the indigenous troops that went over there were from Queensland and New South Wales. Were they mm. from the Kabi Kabi Nation or was that is it just- Oh no. All, oh, no. all over, all over, all over yeah. 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 The majority of them were all writers and they mm. all had that experience as well and that exposure from a very young age. Mm. So writing oh. on the mission. Um, Part, yeah. 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 Look, looking after cattle and sheep and all kinds Absolutely. of Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. So, mm. yeah, it was, it was a lot. Um, it was probably the, the highest percentage was probably from Queensland of um, Aboriginal representatives. And um, actually come to think of it, one of the other um, uh, community members um, whose grandfather also rode in um, the light horse, actually, I don't know if it was a light horse or the Ashiva, sorry, uh, Samak Railway Station, um, was um, Wally, Wally Lewis's grandfather. Oh, yeah, he died over there, yes. Yeah, he died over there. So he was only um, 19 years of age. Mm. And before he left, he um, had a relationship with Wally Lewis's grandmother and had the, And then when they went to war, he died over there and then she had a baby um, and then the, who was actually Wallace's, Wally Lewis's um, father. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. Mm. Sorry, sorry, grandfather. Mm. And then, yeah, yeah. And that was the thing that, that really uh, uh, totally fascinated me was the ways in which the people of Israel actually right throughout their honoured the Australian soldiers throughout that Absolutely. country. With Absolutely. those uh, incredibly beautiful cemeteries and grave sites and memorials and all kinds of things. I mean, you, you just can't... You, it, you shake your head and say, wow, look at this. This is a country outside of this country that has done so much to honour the Australian digger. 
Yeah. Well, Danny, um, that's, a, yeah. that's a good segue to turn to you because you're both Australian and Israeli and and really the Besheva, um, the Battle of Besheva is a, is, a, is a nexus between the histories of our, of our two communities. So how does, you know, be interesting, it feels like that your your twin identity is, is really, um, you know, come to the fore in this whole exercise. Yeah, well, the first thing is that um, doing this, it's an opportunity to redress past wrong in terms of knowing that Indigenous people were part of the Anzac forces. Um, but in terms of identity, um, I think that it's very empowering for those descendants. Now, I know that um, the LC cousin is Kathy Freeman, okay? Now, we're all proud of Kathy Freeman for what she did, but think about it. Her great-grandfather was in Beersheba. And, and I think the whole point of uh, having um, your identity uh, entwined with this history and this heritage can really empower you. And, I, and I, when I met Elsie and, and Ray, I really felt that, okay, it's nice that they're in Israel, but you know, their eyes were shining because, not just because they're in another country and it was, it was really wonderful that the Rona Tranby Trust, I'm talking about a Jewish trust had the foresight of understanding this about identity and heritage and gave them the opportunity. But from what I understand, when I met you, you were very proud. And when you come back to Australia, it's a story that should be told. And yeah. it comes from you. It's not a story, it's your story yeah. and your children's story. And I think that's very significant when we talk yeah. about commemorating um, the Battle of Beersheba or other um, battles that were fought by uh, past um, ancestors. So mm -hmm. in, in, in my case, my great grandfather was the chief rabbi of Sfat. He was a Kabbalist and I'm very proud. I'm not that religious, but I'm very proud that my great grandfather uh, had a name in Sfat. And in a way I've, you know, decided to make Aliyah and come back here. But the story of my identity, in the same way as Ray and Elsie's identity, it's, it's, it's correcting historic justice. And I think that's mm. very important. It's not yeah. just a tour. Mm. Now, um, you'll have to, uh, excuse me if you, if you mentioned this um, when, I was, when I was off air, but um, in November last year, and we've referenced this uh, once or twice during the conversation, but the ABC um, Compass show aired a short film called Ride Like an Anzac, in which the three of you starred. Now, I've seen it, and uh, there is one question someone wants to know where to see it. So if you do want to see it, email me at ll, that is for lockdown learning, ll at zfa.com.au. Um, and I will let you know how you can see it. But Danny, I believe you were the producer of the film. Could you tell us um, a little bit about it and, um, and, and why you got involved? Well, uh, you know, I, I thought, first of all, it was a centenary and it should be documented mm -hmm. and having a reenactment of, uh, of the light horse charging should be documented. But then when the Ride Like an Anzac bike ride um, became really a, a big success in terms of the number of people that were coming. And then when I found out from the Rona Tranby Trust that there, was, that there were Indigenous people coming. And if you remember, Ray and Elsie, the, the day before you left, you were packing. I called Adam. I said, look, Adam, yeah, uh, I know it's right. very short notice. But can you run over to their place and film them packing? Remember that? He did. And he and did. <laughs> no, I had the, because I didn't know, you know, if there's something that I didn't know, like indigenous mm. people that were serving uh, in, in, in Israel, it was an incredible story. So, you know, I, I've done a couple of documentaries before and I thought this story um, is really worth telling. So mm. it was a very yeah. last minute thing. And uh, they filmed you packing, and uh, and mm. then we I decided to to go full on, and mm. uh, and produce this mm. uh, documentary. And I'm glad that the ABC Compass program picked it up, 
and uh, and I don't know if you know, but half a million viewers saw it last year. Yeah. yeah. Time. yeah. Very proud. Thank you very the much other thing I want to, I'm in the process of producing it for Israeli TV because Israelis yeah. don't know about the Battle of Beersheba. And they don't know much about the Anzacs. Only the, the older people know, but the younger people know nothing. And, and this is a story which is the actual historic link between Australia and mm. Israel. Mm. You know? And I want this to be told. So I'm reproducing the film for Israeli TV so they will know, and they'll know about the museum there and the Anzac Trail and the mm. cemetery. And mm. um, it's a project. Mm. After riding for a day in the desert there, I would have preferred to ride a bike. <laughs> You're welcome was, back. I was time. sore as. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, you know, I would like every five years to do something big, you know, like it was mm. 100, 105th year, 110th year. We should do something. And Elsie and Ray, you should uh, tell your kids that there's a possibility. And do the bikes zero. follow the same trail as the horses? Is it, is it exactly the same? It's the same, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Elsie and Ray, you've been to Beersheba, obviously. Um, you rode there um, through a dusty trail. And, and look, I think for many people, Beersheba is a bit of a dusty town a long way from Tel Aviv. Look, you know, do you reckon that, that, that people should go there? Like, like people watching this go to Israel when, you know, when we're finally allowed and the skies reopen, you know, would you recommend them going to Beersheba to, 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 you know, to see that bit of history, what what did you see there that that uh, that you that you think that others should see? If I had enough money, I'd send them all there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I would encourage everybody to go and every Australian, and particularly our own mob, to go and see this particular part of the planet, and just enjoy the incredible history that's there. Um, and, Beersheba itself is just such a interesting place. It's got such incredible history, not only for the Jewish people, but for the other three faiths as well, Christianity and, uh, and Islam. So Beersheba has got all of those connection points there and all of those stories. It's, it's a very deeply spiritual place, as not, not just the history there. And so I just encourage people to go there. Not, and also to see the kinds of um, research that has been done on the light horse at Beersheba, at the, at the memorials there, the Beersheba Memorial for, for, for light, the light horse. It's just absolutely amazing as to what has been achieved there in terms of this history. Lots of stuff that I didn't know, Lots of images and lots of movies and all those kind of things are just absolutely amazing to come and go and see. I just wanted to say one other thing too that what the the Jewish community here through the Rona Tramby Trust did was also help uh, an Aboriginal uh, film crew also come in and take some that they actually put money into it as well as uh, got the government to help to support them, and that uh, particular film was shown on NITV. So this incredible support from the Jewish community is quite extraordinary. And did you guys, um, Elsie, did you manage to see a bit of Israel after you arrived in Beersheba or were you um, straight home? Um, the only time I got to see it was when we had the opportunity of breaking up with the different tour, tour groups. So we had, I think it was like something ridiculous, like five bus loads. Um, oh, yeah. So one of the other organisations that also helped um, get us over there was the um, Australian Light Horse Association. Right. And that was, yeah, that was um, Mr. Barry, Barry Rogers. Rogers. Yeah. He's also yeah. in the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Amazing. So, man, yeah. yeah. So he, if it wasn't for him as well, along with all the other mementos, um, um, so did they amazing just reach people. out and, yeah. and contact you and say, listen, you know, you guys are descended from Anzacs. Do you want to? Do you want to go? Is that is that how it happened? Is that is that where you were involved? In? It actually no. happened. Yeah. Well, my my communication happened through word of mouth, um, through community um, community um, word of mouth. So 
it was mm. through an Aboriginal gentleman by the name of um, Ray Raymond Finn, and um, and funnily enough, Uncle Ray is actually related to me by marriage. So his sister's daughter is married to my first cousin. So, yeah. I, I need a pen and a paper to. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, so his niece is is married to my cousin. Right. Is married, okay. yeah, in yeah. in Kibbutzki in South Australia. So, so yeah, and it was actually quite ironic as well. Um, when we were in Israel, some of the other community mob were all saying, "Oh, so you guys all related?" I was like. Oh, all the black fellas are, all the, all the community <laughs> mob are, but I don't know about these white fellas here. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, but no, it was quite funny. But no, it was through, yeah, Uncle Raymond Finn um, that I had the opportunity of being connected to Barry Rogers. And, and then also that's when I also met Uncle Ray as well. So I knew of Uncle Ray, but it was the first opportunity. That was the first time that I had the opportunity of meeting him face to face. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you should know that there, sorry, there, there are a number of locations Bear, where the light horse uh, uh, had battles. Uh, it's not just Beersheba. Beersheba was the That's main right. one because of the water wells. But, you know, um, Barry Rogers takes groups over yeah. to see the other places that the light horsemen were able to conquer. I and mean, it's just yeah. amazing. It wasn't just one place. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Barry to me is is the the Australian light horse in a nutshell. He knows everything about the Australian light horse and just an incredible friend and an incredible uh, uh, Australian person who's always promoting the yeah, him uh, the and light horse. Kelvin. Yeah, mm. him and Kelvin. Yeah, and, and his wife and family. Yeah. Did you yeah. say Kelvin? Is that Kelvin Crombie? Yes, that's correct. I know, I know yeah. Kelvin. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Kelvin for the news guy. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, oh, so their you... knowledge is just Phenomenal. outstanding. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Danny, you, um, to to change subject very slightly, you you are the founder of the Israel Life Saving Federation. Um, yes. In fact, their logo um, was on our was on our ad because because uh, you know the the Life Saving Federation was a, was a co sponsor of tonight. Um, it feels like that that's another way that Australia and Israel are connected at a, at a, grass loop, a grassroots level. Can you just, um, you know, it probably deserves an entire lockdown learning conversation on its own, but can you give us a quick spiel as to, to how it came about and, and what it is? Okay, well, um, it's, it's surprising that um, the, many of the Anzacs uh, that fought in World War One and Two, particularly in Two, many of them were Australian lifesavers because they were the fit ones. Mm. They were the ones that were ready for battle. They were the ones that, you know, had the courage. And and it's uh, it's documented, and there are beautiful photos, and there is even this uh, amazing uh, ABC three-minute clip of these uh, lifesavers at Bondi in 1939. Uh, and then 1941, there they are in Gaza and in Jaffa. And again, I thought, what a wonderful link. You know, it's a cultural mm. link to know that there were Anzac lifesavers in, in Israel. So uh, last year, myself and uh, another six Australians said, you know, we should use this as a platform of bringing Australian and Israelis together. And we introduced the Nippers program, and uh, we and you know with coronavirus it's really hard to do things. We thought we'd have about twenty people. We had one hundred and twenty kids. Wow. It's actually a coronavirus friendly activity because it's outside, and uh, and we had the capsules, and uh, and we were supported by the Australian Life Saving uh, Association. And one person in particular, Doug Hawkins, who came to Australia, uh, came to Israel, and uh, and I'm very proud that this cultural heritage, uh, which again is a historic link between Australia and Israel, were able to bring to Israel and help save lives. And we're talking about not just one beach. We, it's called the Israel Life Saving Federation. We want to. We are planning to open up in all the beaches and also in schools. So, and we also want to have Australian lifesavers come over and, and teach. So, mm. 
it's it's part of the Anzac yeah. heritage and part of the history. Yeah. And and more than that, I can tell you next year we're actually opening a building in Jaffa. Uh, it's going to be called the Australia Tel Aviv uh, Surf Education Centre, and it's going to be a base. And it's an old Ottoman building, and that's where we're going to have some courses, and uh, you'll get to see it. So um, again, it's strengthening the bond uh, through sport and culture. And that's why I'm chairman of the ILSF, and I really believe that it's just going to grow. Here. Good on you. And look, we are we're heading up to nine o'clock in um, the east coast of Australia. I, I've, I've told people that they can email me if they want um, uh, the link to the film, if they, if, and I can I can find that for them. But Danny, are you still organising a, a private screening, an online private screening of the film in the, in the coming days to mark the? The Correct. Yeah. Of the charge on so Wednesday. How will you, um, participate in that. So, so on Wednesday, this Wednesday, at uh, one o'clock Israel time, which is ten o'clock, I think uh, Sydney, Melbourne time. Yep. We have the Australian, the new Australian ambassador, who will be opening uh, the screening, as well as the defence attaché, and um, again. Uh, we're honored to have Ray and Elsie come as well and speak. And Barry Rogers as well will be there. Excellent. So we're going to have the screening, which is only 25 minutes. Then after we're having like a discussion uh, and also the mayor of Beersheba will be there. So it should mm. be quite interesting. And this is really the first time we are showing this film in Israel, although it's Zoom and everybody can join in. Mm. Uh, but this is instead of doing a full, bike ride. So for those people who want to join and who don't mind staying up a bit late on Wednesday, how can they get the details to the Zoom meeting? Oh, um, if they email me, can I, can, can you, yes, can you email absolutely. me the details? Um, so email there you go, you. if you want to watch the film on your own time, I'll send you that link. But if you do want to watch it as part of this Q&A that happens afterwards, then, uh, then Danny will email me the details and I will be very happy to pass them on. Can I say to uh, all three of you, thank you very, very much mm. for, for joining us this evening. Ray, thank yes. You. Could I just, just add to if people are travelling over there to go up to the old railway siding there at Kinneret uh, in near Tiberias, uh, the Kinneret, I think it's, uh, and have a look also at the um, uh, statue that's been that's been set up there for the Aboriginal diggers there at that particular site there. Shemek was a great battle for the 11th Light Horse and uh, the community have given us that great honour of putting a statue up there for us. So please go and visit, travel all the way through. Welcome to the Holy Land. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, um, I can assure you that, that many people watching this are quite desperate to get back on the plane and, uh, and and travel to see friends, to see relatives, to see the mm. country and the land again. And now I'm sure to um, to go down to Beersheba. And look, I didn't um, I didn't know about the uh, the battle up in the, the Canaric, so um, that will be on my itinerary the next time as well to see that. Um, again, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you everyone for watching us. Um, um, thank you for carrying on the conversation when I couldn't. Carry on. There we go. <laughs> And so uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom, shalom, shalom. 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 Mm.